Hey everybody, today I'm going to show you how I made this cool cigar holder on the lathe. Now normally, this would be a pretty simple little turning project, but I made it more complicated by making it out of cutoffs from an end grain cutting board. Now when working with end grain on a lathe, there's a lot more complications that you have to deal with. So stick around and I'll show you how I got through it. Well, right off the bat, I want to apologize for my voice on this one. Uh, I'm on the tail end of my first cold of the season, but I'm sure it's not going to be my last. My least favorite thing about having kids in daycare is all the colds they bring home to share with me on a regular basis. These cutting board cutoffs are far too cool to just throw away. I'm ashamed to admit it, but many of them have met their demise in my fireplace before I finally started figuring out good ways to use them. This cigar holder goes together a lot like a giant pen would. There are two tubes that get glued inside a blank, so the first thing I have to do is figure out the general size I need and glue a blank together. After the glue dries, I cut the blank so it's one and a half inches square, then I square the ends using my radial arm saw. On this shorter piece, my hands would be far too close to the blade, so I use a bigger block of wood to hold it against the fence while I cut it. Using a center finder and a center punch, I mark the spots where I will drill the holes for the tube. Then, with the blank clamped in a vise in my drill press, I drill a hole all the way through both blanks. The longer blank is actually too long for my Forstner bit to get through, so I have to use a bit extender to get the job done. This is the kind of behavior you get when your vise isn't clamped down to your drill press table and you try to go too long without clearing the chips out of a deep hole. I used 220 grit sandpaper to rough up the surface of the tube so the epoxy would have something to hold onto, just like a pen. I mixed up a small batch of 30 minute epoxy and spread it as evenly as I could over the tube. Then I pushed the tube into the blank, turning it the whole time to make sure everything was well coated. After making sure that the tube was just inside the blank on both ends, I cleaned up any extra epoxy that spilled out and made sure there wasn't any on the inside of the tube. While those blanks are setting up, let's take a look at why turning end grain presents us with some complications. I've got this small square of maple and I drew out the grain orientation on it. Lines representing the direction of the grain from the edge and circles indicating the end grain. In most situations, you would mount wood in a lathe with the grain running left to right like this. When it starts spinning, all that's ever coming at you is the edge grain. When viewed from the end, the end grain just sort of spins in place. When you switch the orientation and have the end grain coming at you, you introduce a different pattern. Now the blank is alternating between end grain and edge grain every quarter of a turn. I drew some arrows on each corner to represent the direction the end grain is traveling in relation to a cutting tool. From this view, you can see that per revolution, there are two instances of the grain coming down towards the cutting tool, and two where the grain is actually going away. Now imagine that your lathe is running at a good working speed, say 3500 RPMs. With the grain changing direction four times per revolution, that's 14,000 directional changes in one minute. Now if you think about typical edge grain turning, even at 3500 RPMs, it never actually changes directions on you. It's just the same direction the entire time. So it's no wonder that turning end grain is actually a bit tricky. Now if you can imagine this coming around and you push a little bit too deeply and you take a catch right here, you can see the grain runs the whole length of that and a catch right here is liable to just pop that whole top off because it's going to run down the easiest line of travel, which is that grain. Here you're not going to have that problem because the grain is going basically back away from itself. So as you're taking off this corner, you're just going to be taking off those shavings until you pass center, and then you're going to start taking the end grain again. After the epoxy hardened, I used my belt sander to slowly remove material until the ends of the blanks were flush with the tubes. This step is basically accomplishing the same thing that a barrel trimmer does on a pen. I put one of the cigar holder bushings into the blank and traced around it just to show you what the end result is going to be. You can see that there's really only going to be about an eighth of an inch of material remaining and I'm going to have to remove the rest. 
This brings us to tip number one, trim away the excess. Trying to turn the square blanks to round and removing that much material all on the lathe is just inviting more opportunity for something ugly to happen. By trimming away the corners first, you're not only removing excess material, but it's that crucial corner material that will make the most violent contact with your turning tools. Next, I finally set the blank up on the lathe. The bushings just use a standard 7mm pen mandrel. If I had a long one, I could turn both parts of the cigar holder at once. Since this mandrel is too short for that, I just have to turn one piece, then the other separately. Tip number two, make sure your tools are absolutely as sharp as possible. My only means of sharpening lathe tools is my belt sander, but it works really well. I also believe that a new blade and a carbide tip tool would work really well, but I haven't tested it. Whatever the case, a sharp tool will slice through that hard end grain, where even a slightly dull tool will have a tendency to bludgeon its way through. Tip number three, spin your workpiece as fast as possible. Based on my earlier math, that may sound counterintuitive. If the grain is changing directions four times per turn, wouldn't you want to slow that down? Actually, no. The faster the piece turns, the more those flat spots will skip past your tool, preventing you from digging in too deeply and causing a nasty catch. Tip number four, take very small cuts. In regular edge grain turning, you can get away with taking bigger bites in order to remove material faster. With end grain, just plan on going slow. Taking a big bite is going to cause a catch and nasty tear out, and depending on the project, you might not be able to recover from it. At first, only small chips are coming off of the workpiece while the corners are being shaved down and the whole thing is becoming round. Now look at those longer ribbons coming off in this high speed clip. That's a good indication that the corners are gone and the blank is now round, because the gouge is continually cutting all the way around. At this point, the trickiest part is over, and I just have to keep taking small bites until I reach the final size. Tip number five is that you've just got to be ready to roll with the punches. Whether that means changing the final shape of the product you're trying to make because of a minor defect, or if it's full reconstructive surgery because of a major issue. Even if you follow all four different tips to the letter, end grain turning is tricky and it can give you some surprises. Now, I've made two of these cigar holders so far, and when I was on the last pass on the first one, I had a little bit of a catch which resulted in a huge tear out. A big chunk came out of the side of it and I was looking right through the workpiece at that silver tube on the inside. I was pretty bummed out when that happened because I figured, I'm gonna have to go buy a new tube and glue it into a new blank and basically start from the beginning. But because of all the changing grain directions in this end grain project, I was actually able to glue that chunk back in and that seam from the crack actually got hidden really well inside all that grain. So I got lucky and was able to just make that one work and finished it out like normal. On a straight walled project like this, I like to start sanding by using some sandpaper stuck to a flat piece of wood in order to even out the hills and valleys. Then I just progress through the rest of the grits sanding normally. I use a bit of mineral spirits to clean off the blank. This also gives me a really good indication of how the project will look with finish on it. Next, I put the second blank on the mandrel and repeat the whole process. Because this piece is so much shorter, I had to put a bunch of spacers on the mandrel in order to tighten it down. This setup works just fine to apply finish. I don't need any torque, I just need it to spin slowly while I throw some finish at it. I set up a deluxe spray booth to keep the lathe bed clean and apply a few coats of spray lacquer. I let the lathe continue to spin while it dries to keep any drips from forming. Is it just me, or is it hard to avoid looking at the used cars in this clip? Twelve grand for a ten-year-old Subaru? Here, take my money! As a side note, if there are any sponsors watching, this is the kind of product placement you can expect if you'd like to work with me. I used my drill press to press all the different parts together. I put several layers of tape between the shiny dome caps and the drill chuck to keep things from getting scratched up. So I wanted to illustrate what happens when you do things the wrong way. So I took that blank that I drew all over and chucked it up in the lathe with the end grain coming at us. 
I'm going to turn it on to a not quite high enough speed. Uh, it's actually about where you would want it if you were just regularly roughing a blank, but with end grain it's going to be too slow. I'm also going to use the same roughing gouge that I used to do this whole project with. So now it's, and I haven't sharpened it since, so now it's kind of beat up and a little bit dull. Probably not really bad, but not as sharp as it really needs to be for cutting end grain. And then on top of all that, I'm not going to cut the corners off like I did on the bandsaw with the, the project blank. Uh, and hopefully between all of this, it's going to be a perfect storm to really show you what can go wrong, or at least how unpleasant this project can be if you don't take the necessary steps. Right away, the catches are so bad that the spur drive started slipping in the blank. I tightened up the tailstock, hoping that it would keep the drive from slipping anymore. So right off the bat, look how bad it chews that up. When it catches that downstroke corner, it really is peeling up the chips of that grain. And on that next corner, it's not so bad but then you turn it around and that downstroke corner is nasty again. So you've got these two opposite corners that are just getting destroyed. We're also running into the problem that it's catching so hard that my spur drive is not even working in here. In fact, let's just pull this out really quick to look at it. It was actually set in there nice and deep and it chewed all the way through. I was catching it so bad. So it it took and recessed that whole thing and now it's not even grabbing on anything. So I'm going to drive this back in again and work on it a little more. Now the only thing we did different on that run was increase the speed on this and you can see how much better that finish is. Now we also got rid of the flats here and here. Uh, which helps a lot because now we're making continuous cuts as opposed to starting and stopping and starting and stopping across those flats. Uh, but you can see that just increasing the speed alone did a lot of good for it. Now I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but you can actually see really dull and then really shiny. And that's actually, this is the end grain coming at you and then it switches and it's the end grain going away. So even at this high speed, it's, you can still see a difference in the finish quality just because of the end grain of the wood. Well, that's pretty much my whole tutorial on how to turn end grain on a lathe. Uh, thanks for checking out my video, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.